Now, following yesterday's midterm elections in the United States, Democrats have won back control of the House of Representatives for the first time in eight years, but they failed to win the massive rejection of President Donald Trump they had hoped for. However, some important victories saw young women and minority candidates elected, but the Republicans still keep the Senate with 51 seats, and Democrats lost ground now down to 43 seats. And in Live on Live this Wednesday, I'm joined in the studio by Nicholas Dungan, who's a political commentator and member of the Atlantic Council. You're very welcome to the programme, Nicholas. Thank you. And I'm joined by Penny Schantz, who is the coordinator of Our Revolution France. Now, this is the successor organisation to Democratic primaries candidate Bernie Sanders' campaign, and this works kind of as a left-wing group inside and outside of the Democratic Party. Uh, thank you as well, Penny, for coming back on the programme. Thank you, David. And we'll also be joined on the line by Amherst University Professor of Economics, that's Gerald Friedman, who is, of course, in Massachusetts. Well, to everybody here, uh, you're all both welcome to the programme. So, Penny, I'll put this to you. Now, there was no massive blue tsunami that uh, people were hoping for on the Democrat side, uh, but it was a victory nonetheless. Are you happy with the outcome today? Well, first of all, I did not believe there would be a great blue wave mm. and thought it would always come down to a few seats. And overconfidence can be very dangerous, as we've seen in the past. Um, this past, the election results are critically important in that we ended one party rule in Washington, and that is not to be underestimated. Uh, at the same time, we're doing much more than that. And I am encouraged, and we can talk more about that as the program goes on. Sure. And Nicholas, I mean, this is how we've been kind of every week we've had a little uh, like look into and having commentators a look ahead at the uh, midterms that took place yesterday. And indeed, the kind of the, the word and the phrase that was being bandied around was this was a referendum on the Trump presidency. So if this was a referendum, if you want to say that, on the Trump's presidency, he's still come out pretty much on top despite losing the House, hasn't he? Yeah, it, it's a referendum, but it's also a local election. So mm. it's the same thing that we see in regional elections in other countries, which is that people are voting for candidates, whether it's senators in Texas or representatives in their own districts, as well as it being a referendum. So it can't be 100% a referendum, mm -hmm. and, and yet it's not 100% just a local election. And, and also it's, it's a party election, because uh, unlike in France, for example, the, the two parties in the states are still very much alive and well as political movements. So... Yes, Trump is uh, wrong to proclaim a massive victory, though we would expect him to do that. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, and the Senate election is very different from the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is much more local. The Senate is state by state. And we six all, years, of course. And six years, years but no. it's also, remember, we, we have to remember that there are two senators from each state, the least populous to the most populous. Um, the... Um, uh, and the House of Representatives has different powers than the Senate. So the House of Representatives is going to be in a position to open investigations into Russia. It's going to be able to open investigations, subpoena Trump's tax returns, which he won't give, and that'll be a protracted court case. So they can put, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of banana skins in front of Trump, but they won't be able to get anything done by themselves. And the Senate... Um, the Senate will continue to approve chief, ju uh, sorry, justices of the Supreme Court, ambassadors and the like. But they may not, my view is they may not lie down in front of Donald Trump the way they have the last two years. Sure. Because even though this, if, even if we think of it as a referendum, and even though he didn't lose it, he also didn't win Very it. Nice. Yeah. And because he didn't win it, right, and because his popularity is the lowest we've seen from, from a president throughout the entirety of the U.S. population. Uh, the, the, the consequence is he's got a, vi a very strong base, which is, very, which is relatively small, and which is very, very loyal to him. Okay? Indeed. And so we've got three types of Americans, those who love Trump, those who hate Trump, and those who like his policies but don't really like him. Well, on that point, actually, and it's something that I, can put to, I would like to put to Penny here, I mean, the... You're saying that, you know, there's, there was the polarization and then there's the, the, the whatever's left of the middle ground. But the one thing that one did see from this uh, midterm election was that it was the largest turnout for a midterm election in over 50 years. But that also in itself speaks yards regarding if this is looking back to 50 years ago, you're looking at the same social upheaval in the United States of the 1960s. So, OK, there has been voter mobilization, but is it also an indictment into the state of polarised uh, society in America today? Okay. 
I think we're witnessing a political realignment in, in America right now. We have Trump and Trumpism on the one side and left-leaning trend on the other. Trumpism has seized control of the Republican Party, exposing all of its worst features, white nationalism, militarism, racism, anti-unionism, isolationism, misogyny, and we could go on and on, mm -hmm. tax giveaways to the rich. And it's a party that's worked as hard as they could to give trillions of dollars in tax breaks to the top 1%. And on our side, we have a broad and growing resistance. Mm -hmm. We also have some establishment Democrats whose opposition to Trump is tepid, focusing on his many faults and not his dangerous fundamental policies. So we have some who wish to be the beneficiaries of the resistance, but not the full participants. And this is where it brings us. Our revolution and progressive left activists are demanding much more than that. And we are motivating people. You had Bernie Sanders embark on a nine-state battleground tour on behalf of Democratic candidates competing in these elections, which included Michigan, Wisconsin, and some of the sure. states where we saw Democrats win. But people across this nation now want a government that makes sure that every American can thrive, no matter how much money they make, no matter what their race, their religion, who they love, or where they're from. And that's motivating people. Indeed, it is. It's mobilizing people. Now, I'm going to um, throw out a question. I think I can um, welcome Gerald Friedman, who's on the line there from Amherst University. Gerald, can you coming in loud and clear? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Okay, that's great. Well, you just um, heard Penny Shantz there talking about, uh, well, the mobile Mobilization uh, from uh, the left wing, if you will, or for, well, for definitely for the Democrats in this election. But um, what, in your opinion, is the next step for the Democrats? Now, Republicans were called to arms to prevent a blue wave, which would lead to a witch hunt, or so they believed, or so could happen. Uh, do you think the first step will be getting him to, uh, as Nicholas here referred to, maybe him revealing his taxes? Oh, I look forward to that, and I look forward to all the investigations. But I agree with a lot of what Penny was saying, that it's very important that the Democrats not let themselves go down the rabbit hole of fighting with Donald Trump. Uh, we know Hillary Clinton's campaign against Trump was one of the most negative in history, where she was properly talking about all the horrible things about him. But that doesn't win you over when you... Um, the votes of working class and middle class Americans who have been suffering economically for over 40 years. Those are the people who have abandoned the Democratic Party, and the Democrats need to focus on issues like health care and tax reform and jobs and union protections so that they can win back those voters. And carrying on from that, uh, Gerald, what about reigning in Trumponomics now that the House is in uh, democratic control? I mean, there's the US-China trade war. You've got winners and losers all across America from this trade war. From You've got soybeans that are no longer being sold, and then you've got certain people whose aluminum business is going through the roof. I mean, will the Democrats be able to smooth that one out? Uh, probably not, <laughs> honestly. They control the House by a relatively small margin. Um, the Republicans still control the Senate. Um, and, of course, they have the White House. And we have a very – we have a presidential system in the United States. Um, so they're going to be very – they'll be able to stop a lot of new initiatives, um, but other things are going to continue. Um, judicial appointments, trade policies. Unfortunately, the foreign policy of the Trump administration is not going to be affected much by what's happened. Um, I just want to say one other thing about the, about the blue wave. People are focused too much on the highly undemocratic Senate. If you look at governorships and you look at the popular vote, the Democrats captured almost 10% more of the popular vote in the House races than did the Republicans. This really was a repudiation of Trump. Okay, well, now he still has a very strong, solid base. Now, I just uh, see uh, Nicholas Dungan here uh, shaking his head. You, you don't believe that uh, to be well, I the think case. I, first of all, I think what we need to make clear to listeners is that while we have two people who essentially are looking at this from a Democrat standpoint, I'm an analyst. Mm. Uh, I'm not... I'm not looking at it from a Republican standpoint. I'm looking at it from sure. the point of view of an independent analyst. And, and what, the reason I was shaking my head is that it's all very well, and this is exactly, I think, the problem that the Democrats are going to have between now and 2020. Uh, uh, the, 
the reason I was shaking my head is it's all very well to say that the Senate is undemocratic. The Senate was designed to be that way. It's all very well to talk about the popular vote, but the popular vote doesn't win elections in the United States. And the problem that the Democrats have from the point of view of an analyst, not from the from a partisan standpoint, mm -hmm. is that they have no narrative. They have no ideas that the that the population of the United States wants to subscribe to. And many of their political positions are extremely far to the left of what most American families, most American households feel comfortable with. So they, they weren't able to sell that with with uh, with Hillary Clinton, who was essentially representing the plutocrats, but with left-wing positions. And so they're going to find themselves. And I, I think what we need to concentrate on is not what people would like to have happen, not the wishful thinking, but what's actually likely to occur. And let me give you two quick ones on that. I think, first of all, that the Democrats will have to come way closer to the center before they have any chance of winning anything significant. There's a very, very low risk in voting Democrat in the House of Representatives elections because the House of Representatives has almost no power of initiative over anything. But, in, but to, to elect a Democrat president, you're going to have to have somebody much closer to the center. Okay. And the only candidate they have now who even has a chance of beating Donald Trump is Mike Bloomberg. And secondly... The, uh, within the Republican Party, the Republicans are also, uh, the Republicans could very well come to a point where over the next two years, they view Trump as more of a liability than an asset. Mm. And if they think they're going to lose the presidency because Trump can't win re-election, there could be challenges to Trump from within the Republican Party. And I would see that coming again from a more centrist, uh, uh, a more centrist Republican yeah. who is, wait, sorry, who is Mitt Romney. Sure. Right, so you could end up with two billionaires, Romney and, and, and Bloomberg, Bloomberg, fighting for the presidency. Well, I, I mean, I, I just, I just want to. Well, there's one thing that I just I, want to want to make a, a point there that, uh, uh, you know, picking up on what uh, you've just said, um, there, Nicholas. I mean, one example one could say was the Beto O'Rourke Cruz race in Texas, where basically it came out that like it was the Texans, even though he, he did a very good, he, very good stab at it. He had um, 48 percent to uh, O'Rourke uh, to Cruz's 51 percent. Um, but it's just that places like those red states just aren't ready for a liberal such as uh, Beto O'Rourke. So what, do, what would you have to say, Penny? Okay, several things. I disagree with most of what you said respectfully. It's not very um, surprising at it's, all. Um, first of all, in terms of let's get to your but That's because you're not question. approaching it as an Excuse analyst. Me. You're Excuse approaching me. it from a partisan standpoint. I didn't interrupt standpoint. you. I'd ask you You were shaking your head. Just let, her, just, let her, just let her answer yeah. then. Okay. Some races that we're looking at, they didn't start with a level playing field. And you look at how far... People when you say level playing come. field, you're, you're talking about voter suppression or yes. Um, you look at level where... playing. You look at Florida. You look at racism. You look at voter suppression. You look at fear mongering. You look at funding directed at some conventional Democrats versus some more of the progressive Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, I've been very encouraged as to how well progressives did in this election. In terms of where the American population is, a number of polls show a majority of voters, including a number of Republicans. Republicans support some, fair, some form of universal health care, for example. One poll found 70% of Americans support providing Medicare to every American. When we're looking at diversity and who won these elections, we're looking at women, but not just any kind of women. Well, I, if I can just finish one moment. Briefly, yeah, we're yeah. looking at two Democratic Socialist women, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You're looking at Rashida Tlaib. You're looking at others who won a number. Um, I want to bring up the point, Penny, thanks for, for those figures and that data, to, to seeing how the, the left shift has, has, has gone. But I want to go back to what Nicholas was saying there, is that if the Democrats want to, be a vi want to have a viable contender or have any stab at the 2020 presidential elections, they're going to have to really, really come back into the centre, where all of the ground is coming from. So let's just have a look. Um, um, our, our friend um, Gerald uh, Friedman in Amherst was saying that... Nancy Pelosi, or that people can't be jumping down the rabbit hole to follow in to tackle Trump straight away. And Nancy Pelosi uh, took the moral high ground. She's the Speaker of the House. She took the moral high ground today f following the vote, say the Democrats would work with the Trump administration and avoid a gridlock in Congress. What common ground 
do you believe actually exists that can be built upon that? All right, well, let me, let, let's put this in an even larger context, okay? We're looking at culture wars in the United States. It's very clear who's on which side. We're looking at a clash of civilizations outside the United States. The problem is that everybody is nostalgic for this post-war world where, where everything was clear, right? The trouble is that everything that happened after the fall of the wall globalization after 1989 has created a world which is much less fair and much less inclusive in those countries, mm. right, which are the developed countries. It's been fantastic for people in developing countries, right? So, you, so people are left behind in Europe as well. You're going to see this same rift between populism and nationalism uh, on the one hand and globalism in the European parliamentary elections in May. Yeah. Bannon is working very, very hard to create that. Right? Mm -hmm. And I knew the Bannon extremely well. Mm -hmm. I knew extremely I knew Bannon extremely well in the late nineties when we were both bankers at Societe Generale and before he was radicalized, but he is not to be underestimated. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are looking at a global phenomenon which is a clash of civilizations, a clash of cultures, it's a culture war in the United States. So it's not just about a divided government, it's about a divided society in a divided country, in a world where those divisions are going to be <laughs> exacerbated. Indeed, we so if the Democrats, to go back to your question, yeah. don't have a narrative, they're not going to get elected. Well, then, Penny, I want you to take the pick up on that. So let's just go. But we know that it is definitely a global issue that is rising around everything from Eastern Europe to uh, down in South America. We have it. It's, it's, it is a global phenomenon in the Philippines. But I just want to go, Penny, just we have we're running out of time. But I'm, I will try and get this briefly, if you will. Is there a middle ground that your faction, let's say, of the Democratic Party could find in working together in the House of Representatives? Are there any kind of laws that are being pushed through that you could actually jump on board with? Well, I believe there are. I mean, I think that, as I've said, most of the American population is for Medicare for all, and I would hope to see some progress on that. I think on infrastructure, we could see some progress. Hopefully, um, there's increased support for increasing the minimum wage, hopefully to $15 an hour. Criminal justice reforms another area. Job equity. Um, there's increasingly issues. So there are things out there. Well, um, unfortunately, we are have 30 seconds left, and I would just take that time to first and foremost um, thank all of you for being on the programme. That's, of course, uh, Nicholas Dungan from the Atlantic Council. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Penny Schantz uh, from Our Revolution France, thank you for being on the programme. Thank you. And Joel Friedman on the line from Amherst University. Sorry, Joel, we hadn't got a lot of time between the argy-bargy <laughs> here, but we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, and from all of us here at Paris Live PM, have a great day.